and giving all the speakers a big hand, I think this is Okay, um, so that's really a, uh, an extremely stimulating uh, set of talks that we've had uh, covering a lot of ground, but there's still a lot of ground to be covered. Um, when we began here, I said that we had a very distinguished panel of speakers, but uh, of course we have an equally distinguished uh, audience here, and so uh, we want to, to hear from all of you, and I won't stand in the way a moment longer. So whoever would like to uh, yes abhirup yeah so that's very interesting uh, discussion so the question is the following and this is to himanshu uh, uh, so here's a model of service provision public service provision which requires let's say you know some amount of money right so we agree that given the particular amount of money that we allocate to some of these public services uh, these public services cannot do very well, right? I mean, the amount of money that goes into health, the amount of money that goes into education, to actually make a difference to quality of education, quality of health through the public sector, we would require a larger quantum of funds that are directed to them, which may not be possible to give given the particular kind of tight budgetary situation you talk about. So in that context, would it not be better to think about the same amount of money to be given through universal basic income. So this is not a question of saying that should we not give more services, it's that more services would cost us a lot more money. So why not give this particular amount of money to people so that they can demand it and maybe there's a private sector response because of this income, right? So I don't disagree that maybe, you know, it, things would be great if we could make our public schools much better and everything, but, but that requires a lot more money and you just said we don't have that money. So, so in that, so the debate should be, in some sense, should take that into account, uh, you know, in 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 how we, we look at this issue. This is the kind of uh, what we call as the planted questions. Uh, in a sense, not in a sense. This is like a very obvious question, and I think the answer, best answer, could be given by. But I, I'll, I'll try and give an answer. You know, you don't have service provision. You don't have schools. You don't have health facilities. Take your model a little further. Give money to everybody. What will happen? We are basically going to create excess demand where there is no supply that exists. It's the private sector which is going to fill up. And we all know what is going to happen. And whether public sector is working or not, you have to spend money on the public sector. There is absolutely no... And that is the more Nordic model. And that is one thing that you have to take a key uh, uh, message from the Nordic model. Public services have to be free. They have to be funded by the state. And they have to be free, universal, with whatever amount of funding that is required. There should not be any doubt on that. But this idea that because the public sector is inefficient and therefore we give money to everybody and the supply will, uh, I mean, will come automatically because there is going to be a demand, that I think is problematic. It's something which is going to basically lead to the kind of inequalities that we are talking about today. People with money, people with have access to resources will go to the private sector. But a lot of the poor people who do not have access to these resources or loans or whatever you call it will actually be excluded out. It will actually may turn out into a perverse outcome than what we are actually trying to do, which is to reduce inequality. So, uh, I think uh, coming from outside, none of us coming from outside know what India should do. But it can, I think there's something we can learn from each other. And I think the cumulative nature of reform is not always very well understood. That it, 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 it's reform, that they are 
taking North and Europe that I know the best. Then I think one victory in one front laid the foundation for new steps ahead on other fronts. So it was sort of compressing the income distribution at the same time as we sort of achieved better social provisions on other, that they went in together with each other. So there was, it was more that, that, that people have higher income in the bottom that sort of supported the new reforms in, in uh, new steps and you can use democracy in, in new ways. Class collaboration, for example, a lot of class collaboration that most uh, radicals uh, like me didn't like uh, in the beginning, but when we understood it, we understand how progressive it is and how uh, productivity enhancing it is that also workers, class collaboration means that workers get the share of the profits and, uh, and you'd get much more of a collective interest in it. But the basic thing is to say that, that Norway and Sweden, when they started doing these things, they were much poorer than, for example, South Africa today, much poorer than most uh, middle-income countries. They were not uh, as poor as India. The, it, it wasn't the economy that, uh, that, that made it. It was the, this, the, uh, the cumulative effect of interplay between political support, achievements, new uh, stands for new uh, progress, new reforms, and this went on in a community manner. And I don't think, I think that Norway was very happy to have very strong unions. So I consider the universal basic share as a substitute for having sort of a basic union in the bottom of, uh, of the system. So people see that they get the share of the benefits of they get they get property rights in the new uh, robots because they get 10% of the benefits of them. And I think it's, it's in that aspect it is a, it is a, it isn't either or reforms or a basic share. They are, are work together. You get, you get people and political interest in progress. That's the main thing. Will you introduce yourself? Myself, Abhishek uh, Kumar from Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research, Mumbai. So I have a kind of a clarificatory question. When you talk about uh, universal basic income, you don't have some kind of poverty elevation program in your mind. Or do you have? If you have, then I have a question. You're looking at me. A any of you, okay. I don't. I don't have one in mind. Yeah, because uh, if, so then I don't have a question. But if any of you <laughs> name. <laughs> If any of you claim that there is something of poverty alleviation, alleviation in, the ma in mind, then I have a few questions, actually. If you don't have them, uh, Karan Nakpal, um, two questions. A quick one on the political economy of immigration. This is from a developed country's perspective. What does universal basic income or share do to popular support or lack thereof? For immigration, uh, already, I mean, the fact that immigrants are welfare scroungers is, a, you know, is in the public imagination, or at least is being sought to be put in the public imagination. Uh, would you agree that UBI or UBS would make this transfer a lot more salient, and therefore may reduce support for immigration? The for you know, people coming from outside, we we shouldn't be paying them. Uh, the second question is something that I uh, probably have to think through myself, and I haven't. And it'll be interesting if uh, uh, the economists on the panel can shed some light on uh, how to think about it is that uh, from a micro perspective, from a household model perspective, uh, if universal basic income is the amount of income given to every individual in the household, does that strengthen incentives to have larger households uh, and therefore may have an effect on fertility? Thank you. So, uh, yeah, Rajiv, go ahead. Yeah, um, those are interesting questions. This is on. Yeah, so um, regarding immigration, so I think one should look at immigration as a potential, uh, a policy that can have potential net benefits in the aggregate level, uh, but which are not evenly distributed. And so it's a part of an entire set of policies, including technological change, including uh, globalization, trade, and so on and so forth. And what, what the universal basic income does is it gives people a stake in, uh, actually, especially in the form of the universal basic share. Um, if you have any kind of policy that increases aggregate income at the economy level, and everybody has a share of that aggregate income, then there's a tendency to be more supportive of that policy and not less. Now, with regard to the scrounging in the imagination, I think that one of the reasons that the Swiss referendum failed on universal basic income is, for, is it was too inclusive, actually. It was too easy for people from the outside to get access to it. If it's restricted, let's say, to citizens or people who 
uh, have been, you know, permanent residents, say, in the United States for five years at least, or some, some criteria like that, um, especially with regard to citizenship, then that takes care of that concern, I, I, I believe. Um, the second question you had, just remind me quickly, because that was also interesting. The effect of, so if universal basic income is money given to every individual Yeah, the pronatalist, yes. So this <coughs> is exactly the design question about whether it should cover minors or not, you know? And so it, that's entirely related to whether or not you want a pronatalist uh, regime. And furthermore, that's why I think it's worth thinking about, uh, so for example, you could have a limitation on the number of uh, uh, children that are covered, right? So at some point, additional children are not covered. Um, or, uh, um, um, or in, in, in the Indian context, possibly you know, linked to policies that I know Anukriti and others have looked at, which are to do with the gender composition of the, uh, of the household. So I think there's a lot of flexibility in design that could, that could be used. I don't think any of those concerns are fatal at all. In fact, they, they can give rise to interesting design questions. Question for Amarjeet. Uh, I found it interesting that UBS stands for either Universal Basic Share or Universal Basic Services. And I didn't really, so in a sense, where I saw you converge was to say that we need better accounting for who this is going to. And whether it's in the form of services or it's in a form of a transfer is sort of secondary in some sense. And, you know, I think you're all on board there. Um, the, the question is really. If we do the services, a lot of times people say, this is Abhirup's question, that it's not, just not being used properly. We don't want to pay taxes because they're not being used properly. Huh? There's no point spending on public health. It might as, you know, we might as well give the money to someone. So Amarjeet, in your experience, both in Bihar and in the government, you've had many years of this now. Um, what, can we, what can we make? What can we do to make these public services work better? And the question to the rest of you, is you know we realize that there is decision making problems involved within households right so when you're giving a transfer you're giving it to someone but you care about a lot more people in the household and that doesn't really need to go through necessarily so how are you going to deal with that with the universal basic income um, uh, thank you for your question no i think uh, uh, abhirup's question also i fully respect uh, the point that you are making, this challenge of resources. Number one, uh, the first point I wish to make is, while yes, additional resources are required, but what comes out very, very clearly, uh, both in the health sector and the education sector, uh, with the private sector provision as well, meeting some of the requirements, states like Tamil Nadu and Kerala, where healthcare uh, the universal coverage is available, we find that the countervailing presence of a functional public system has consequences for the quality and cost of the private care which is available. So very clearly, there is a room for both kinds. As, as, as known to everybody, both these states, 55 to 60 percent of the care is in the private sector. But that functional countervailing presence of a public system does have consequences for it. The second issue which comes out very clearly that many of the challenges are crafting and governance challenges. And I, I raise this because especially in the case of education, I think many a time we are a little ahistorical in our analysis with regard to primary education data. 1986, 42nd round NSSO, I'd refer each one of you to that. 69.2% girls in rural India, 6 plus, not enrolled in a school. We often forget it was not 47, it was 1986. When even enrollment of girls in primary schools in rural India was a far cry. Now, I think all said and done, at the policy level, across political parties, there was consensus that there is a requirement for universal elementary education, partly the Supreme Court's intervention, partly a whole lot of other changes in policy. The provisioning did improve. Today, if you do, in fact, uh, Jean Drez and the team, we did the probe report the first round for the states. And the second round, a revisit was done in 2006. And uh, what the revisit found that, yes, number of schools had gone up, buildings were better, provision for drinking water, toilets was better. But within the classroom, the learning was still not happening. So it's not just a matter of more public investments. It's also a case of efficient public systems delivering services. 
So that is uh, more so in the case of education than in the case of health, where a lot of the infrastructure built over the years, uh, actually with that catalytic provisioning and change in management of public systems, there are possibilities there. Health, again, what it demonstrates very clearly, the National Health Mission, you know, from a little below a percent of GDP public expenditure to a little above a percent of expenditure, based on very basic efficiency of public systems, it does speed up the rate of reduction of infant mortality, maternal mortality and fertility rates, uh, decline of fertility rates. The point which emerges very clearly in these, some of these sectors, the choice, you know, the provisioning may well come for secondary and tertiary care, but a single payer system in, for universal health coverage seems to be having, is perhaps the most efficient way of providing health care anywhere in the world. You may engage private, Canada does that, but the provisioning is done in such a manner that, so I think some of these principles, given the uh, information asymmetry in the sector, so, so other issues as well. So I think uh, the broad point is that incomes alone do not answer all the requirements for a household to develop its full human potential. Income transfers will be even more effective if the basics are attended to, not by doing the same of what the, you know, more of the same, but perhaps departures which address the challenges of developing public services as well. Thank you. Can, can I? You know, uh, uh, sorry, I want to really listen to your questions, but I, but I have to express a mild amount of surprise that this discussion is degenerating into the question of private versus public, right? It's, uh, that's not the issue at all. I mean, there are certain items that only a government can provide. I, I firmly believe this, and there is no question of using, of saying, uh, scrap all of that, give people cash, and let them buy things from the market. I don't think Kala or I or Rajiv came even close to suggesting that. Uh, in fact, this is why I put up the subsidies table. If you look at the table, of which, let's try to re remember the table, it had two elements in it. It actually had three elements. One was health, education, NREGA, etc., which I kept aside. The second one had what was called explicit subsidies, which includes the PDS and stuff that's provided in kind. Yeah? And then there, is, uh, there was uh, an estimation of what are called revenues foregone. And this doesn't even include the, 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 the holy cow of Indian politics, which is the agricultural income tax. I'm leaving that issue out. Even leaving that out, we are close to 7% of, of subsidies that are revenues foregone. Using the calculations that Hibangshu uh, provided, a universal basic share could start, even if we took that 7%, could start small, but it would be providing, not touching any of the other things that he's so concerned about, it would be providing half the poverty line to every man, woman, and child in the country. Okay? And the point was that a share, even if it's fixed as a fraction, will increase in real terms and nominal terms it cannot be inflated away. The story about pensioners receiving 200 rupees then and 200 rupees now, none of that is going to happen if things are denominated in terms of a share. But to say we need public services first and until then we are not going to entertain anything else, I think is uh, taking matters a bit beyond the pale. So I just wanted to make that comment. Um, thank you for, your, uh, for this interesting discussion. I just have one question, which, oh, sorry, Amatika. Um, so my question is related to um, when we give this money, I'm not sure if uh, what the previous experiences, for example, have been, but um, are there, um, let's say this is windfall income, right? So this is income that one did not uh, expect. And how do consumption behaviors change then uh, amongst poor people versus middle income. So that's my question, thank you. Maybe we can collect a few, yeah, because we're running out of time, so. Uh, my, hi, I'm Yashwant. Uh, my question is aimed at Professor Devraj Day. Uh, so 
I sort of have a criticism against uh, universal basic share. So I feel that if there's a fixed income, even in, when the economy is not doing well, which is especially when the people need a lot more money than when the economy is doing well, I think the fixed income or the fixed amount of money which is distributed among, um, among these people is more beneficial than a share of the total GDP. So, I mean, this is kind of pro-cyclical. So what do you say about it? Um, I'm Simon Alder. I have a question about uh, urbanization. Um, so cities are, of course, more expensive. As you mentioned, they are more expensive to live, but they're also innovative places and, uh, and more environmental friend friendly places. So I was wondering if we have a nominal, a nominal um, basic income that, as you mentioned, gives an incentive for people to live not in cities, and we may be creating a wedge, preventing urbanization. And I was just wondering whether that could have negative consequences for innovation and uh, environmental consequences as well. And actually, if I may, a second question on automization. So what is different about automization now than 50 years ago um, that it now is a threat for, for, for employment, for instance? Okay, uh, so who, Rajiv, would you like to uh, go first? Or? Oh yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, so this idea of the cities uh, being dense but also innovative and generally productivity is higher in cities, but it's not actually clear, I don't think, uh, uh, as to whether there's, this is due to selection, that the people who move to the cities are different in some way, their characteristics are different than those who don't move, or whether cities actually make people more productive, right? There's some combination of the two, but where, you know, where it falls is not entirely, I think, empirically clear. This is the idea of the idea of moving to productivity, right? So the, uh, if you move people from urban to uh, rural sure. to urban areas may in increase aggregate uh, income is, is, is possible. Uh, I'm not sure we know exactly how much that effect would arise. If more people <coughs> moved, whether or not you would get more increased productivity or you're just gonna get people who, who would be unproductive wherever they happen to be, uh, relatively speaking. But having said that, even if it were true that people are more productive in cities, people are not moving. There's a whole group of people who are just not moving for, because they've got family ties, because they've got uh, attachment to their, their communities, and they're just not moving. And they're staying in communities which are getting devastated. I tried to give some examples of this. And that's having re uh, political repercussions and, and all kinds of public health problems as well. So regardless of the efficiency gains of moving to productivity, uh, there's something blocking it, something social blocking it, and that there's some consequences we have to keep in mind. What is different about automation is, uh, again, it's speculative because we haven't seen this big wave yet, you know? But really, when you think about, you know, some of the projections for, you know, how many automobiles would need to be produced, for example, how many call center operators would be put out of jobs in a flash, right? It can be very, very quick. It seems to me, I, I'm just speculating, that the scale is different from the trade shock, that the trade shock was really big and bad, much worse than we thought, right? The, the recent literature is telling us. And the technology shock could be much order of magnitude larger than that. That's, but it's speculation. We, we don't know yet. I think uh, the best study is, is this one? The best, the yeah, 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 no, it's useful. Okay. <laughs> I speak in stereo, okay? Uh, so, um, I think the best idea in economics is uh, general equilibrium. It's really the best idea ever in economics. But it's used so partially on a very, not very interesting thing of prices and quantities. Of course, there's politics, it's uh, uh, suggestions for uh, uh, reforms, it is uh, support for reforms, it is provision of uh, public services, it is uh, <laughs> demands from the, all these things institutions can adjust in a general equilibrium. And the most general rule in, in uh, the general equilibrium theory that I would propose, that is uh, that those who have the goal get the rule, and those who get the rule get the goal. And you have to break that, that, is, that holds in many countries. It's a general equilibrium phenomenon that is, provides a support for an inegalitarian society. And one way to, to break that rule is to have a system of continuous 
redistribution. And one system of continuous redistribution requires some sort of basic share. And that will give support to a lot of other policies. In Sweden, for example, they, they didn't have sanitation before they introduced the welfare state. The, the, the welfare state came, and then they got a lot of political demands for sanitation, for better schools, for better things. And of course, then that supported more welfare spending. These things are not either or, they are cumulative and they help each other. That's the general equilibrium approach to policy reform and to income distribution. And I, th I think we have to have that view, uh, also thinking that a, a, a universal basic share can give rise to social organizations that can come with new demands that we don't think about uh, today. We want to sort of empower people by having a sort of basic subsidies for, for more <laughs> freedom for them to organize and express themselves. That, that's the, the meaning of it. It's, and I think this is a basic part of it. And it could come in many forms. Uh, but it, unions are in decline, social organization in decline, so we have to have some basic support from the bottom for better representation of uh, collective rationality in any society. And, this is, and then you can use markets, you can use uh, political competition, you can use anything, but you, are, you have corrected a failure in, uh, from the start of that you have some uh, uh, more funding in the bottom that, and, and, and also a sh in, in give people a, sh a share so they can get some of the benefits of the improvements that the reforms uh, uh, creates. Not, not going to specific groups, but to everybody. So it's a, just a quick uh, response to what uh, Debraj was saying. I think it is important. We come back to finally the question, and it is about the politics of it. And I think uh, there's not, and, and, and we shouldn't avoid it. And it's a very open uh, question. Suppose we get the 600 lakh crore, 6 lakh crore rupees, which is the tax foregone, and then we get it. Then as a government, what are the options that we have? Can we use it for improving the services, public services? Should we use it for increasing the access to those public services? Or should we basically give it away as universal basic transfer, even if it means 500 rupees per person or 200 rupees per person? I think the question there has to be looked at simply because it's also coming from the assumption that all subsidies are bad. And I want to emphasize here, not all subsidies are bad. And the way we calculate subsidies, at least the implicit, I mean, the, the, not the explicit subsidies, but also the implicit subsidies, you must realize if you try counting that, North European countries or Nordic countries will count it much higher. Simply because if you get a free education in JNU and your cost of teaching is 2 lakh rupees or whatever XYZ, that is counted as cost of subsidy. If I am giving you subsidy for using an electric uh, vehicle, that is counted as subsidy. If I am giving you subsidy to use public transport, so all these implicit subsidies that you get to see 300,000 crores, all those subsidies are not actually a wasteful one. And governments do it. And governments should do it. If want to increase public transport, making it free, that is what pa Paris did it when there was a crisis. That's not a subsidy. I would encourage that kind of a subsidy. But I think the question here is, should, if I get the a one rupee extra or two rupees extra, should I use it just to give away money or should I create the basic infrastructure? I think the basic infrastructure is, is not, I don't think there is a choice. It's a necessary condition. Unless you do that, any other thing is, uh, I don't think has, will, will have uh, any impact. So you need to do that and I don't think, uh, we, we can uh, debate much on that. Okay, so I just want to give uh, a chance to the people in the other rooms. Uh, does anybody have a question? Otherwise... Is, uh, is there somebody from one of the other rooms who would like to uh, intervene speech, at this point? <laughs> Maybe there's nobody there and, you know, <laughs> this is one of those things where I'm... Uh, they went for Okay, so uh, since we are now, um, you know, a few minutes over time, um, I think, Abiru, did you really have something desperately pressing to say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, so he, he will say it afterwards. So I think that, uh, you know, we'll bring this uh, very stimulating session to a close. I want to thank uh, the speakers, uh, the panelists, once more for a very stimulating discussion.
Uh, I'll just take. Yeah. Uh, so I'll just take two minutes to to conclude this uh, this conference. Um, so yeah, vote of thanks. Uh, so you know, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank the uh, the ISI administration, and then uh, you know, to uh, for for all the uh, I mean, administration and our colleagues for for all the support. And but my uh, you know, I mean, very sincere thanks to the uh, all the uh, ISI workers. My uh, you know, the the cooks, the service boys, the housekeeping staff, electricians, the computer uh, staff. Uh, for you know uh, running this uh, conference very smoothly and uh, you know my army of student volunteers uh, who for the <coughs> last uh, three days or some of them for uh, last one month uh, you know worked very hard to as you have seen the conference was running almost like in on autopilot for the last three days